Neck throughs, guitars, they're like a guy that you won't have a beer with you. I want to hear what's pushing the notes. Freddie King and B.B. King, Albert King, and let's not forget Burger King. I don't want to blow my knuckle out. Stainless steel is the work of the devil. These go to 11. From the East Amplification Tone Labs in Baltimore, Maryland, it's the Amps and Axes Show. With your hosts, Jeff the Godfather of Low Wattage Amps Bober and Mick Marcelino. Well, good day to you, Mr. Bober. Good day to you, Mr. Marcelino, and welcome to yet another fine podcast. Oh, yeah. And we have to thank everybody, man. You guys have been turning on your friends, and we really appreciate it. That's right. Thank you so very much. And uh, you know it. We couldn't do it without you. Yeah. And, uh, you know, definitely tell your friends. And when you do, uh, make sure you tell them you heard it here first. That's right. Because there's always something you're going to hear first here. And, uh, yeah, tell your friends to tell your friends and tell their friends to tell their friends. And (laughs) you're always going to hear something new. And uh, we're going to hear something new today. This is a a new guest for us. Um, So we're going to take a pause for the cause and bring up the – the person who is currently guitarist for Evanescence uh, and has done some other very cool things. Uh, so we're going to take a break from, and a pause for the cause and come back with our guest of the week, Miss Jen Majura. Hey, this is Frank Falbo with Falbo Guitars, and you are listening to Amps and Axes. Hi there, this is Matt Wakeling, host of the Guitar Speak podcast, a weekly show produced in Sydney, Australia, interviewing leading guitarists, luthiers and gear builders from Australia and all around the world. We're into all sorts of styles, all sorts of gear, so if you love the guitar, why not look us up on iTunes or Stitcher and join thousands of listeners around the world who tune in to the Guitar Speak podcast. It, it sounds like you've you might have listened to the show before, so you know you know where we're going to go here. I yeah. always take a, I always take a, a trip in the wayback machine with our guests. Yeah. So um, tell us a little bit about where Jen Majora was, and I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah, absolutely fabulous. Excellent. I love the best uh, pronunciation of my name. It actually takes place in Spain because then my name is Jen Majora, and it's Mahora, awesome. Yeah. Mahora. <laughs> <laughs> but it's Jen Majora. Yeah, right. <laughs> Nice, nice. So tell us, you know, about Jen, where you were born and raised and what got you into this crazy, wacky, wonderful world of music. So give us some history. <laughs> awesome. Um, I was born um, in south of Germany um, and I grew up actually on a farm. So I spent my childhood a lot playing in the woods, you know, and we had cows and chicken and all that stuff, which was pretty awesome. Um, where, what, dad, town? what town? Um, it's called it's called near near Stuttgart. Oh, it's near Stuttgart. It's, it's it's a tiny little 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 village. It's like a Hobbit town, you know. So <laughs> nobody ever heard of it. So it's it, I always mention Stuttgart. It's easier. Well, mention mention the town because my wife was actually from Stuttgart. No way! You gotta be fucking kidding me. Yeah, she is. <laughs> so there is this this town called Esslingen. Esslingen. Mhm. Very nice. He told you. (laughs) I'm going to write that down. Well, I didn't think I would know where it was, but she may very well. (laughs) All right. Yeah, well, and um, I I grew up as the daughter of a bass player. So my dad has always been into music and uh, playing shows, you know. And when I was a tiny little kid, I always went to the gigs he played and sat nearby the stage. So it was never really like, oh, I'm... getting into this new world of music after I finished my, my high school. So I was kind of, I was always familiar with music. And um, cool. I never had this this point where you actually question yourself, what will I become uh, when I'm grown up, right? I mean, usually people go like, oh, I want to become a police officer or whatever. But mm-hmm. I wanted to become a musician from the very first moment I ever thought about what I want to be, 
that would be like at the age of four or something. So, and wow. it never changed. It's the only thing that I can do. <laughs> <laughs> Following a dad's footsteps. Was, was dad a full-time musician? Yes, he was a full-time musician in, um, in the 80s. And he's from Thailand. Oh. So he uh, was touring Germany with his Thai band. And uh, met up with my mom, madly fell in love, and ba boom, <laughs> here I am. <laughs> so, what, what style Very of music nice. was he playing? He was into, like, they did cover stuff and funk soul music and covers. Um, and it was really cool because the band was uh, called The Fantasy. Oh, and nice. uh, it was really, I. Even if I see pictures of my dad rocking back in the days, it's it's so much fun to see him. It's it's really cool. He's still playing, you know. It's it's not that Good. much any longer, but um, but he's still playing, and it's it's beautiful. So you know, music was in my family ever since. And you said he was a bass player. Did you start on bass? Because I know you play bass and guitar, right? <laughs> yeah, but. Um, in my defense, I have to say that I never, <laughs> I started to play the guitar at the age of, seriously, at the age of eight, I believe. And um, I turned into a bass player for exactly one year. That was May 2014 till <laughs> summer 2015, because um, I got asked by this pagan metal band if I would consider joining them on the bass. And then I was like, okay, nice. guys, listen, I am a guitar player. So, of course, no, but hey, good luck. <laughs> and the singer wrote back to me again, like a few minutes later, he was like, yeah, okay, yeah, we know, you're a guitar player, and so? <laughs> and, I, and I sat there, I was like, oh, okay, um, well, I guess I could give it a try. So um, it's, I learned a lot in this year, um, but I, I don't consider myself as a bass player, you know? I feel different, I move different, I think different, I hear different, and... Um, yeah, I played the bass, but I would never, ever dare to say that I'm a bass player. I mean, there are great guys out there, you know, like, like I don't know, T.M. Stevens back in the days. He was one of my first, mm. first experience I've been touring with. Um, and they're awesome, like Billy Sheehan. And those guys are bass players, you know. Yeah, for I was sure. just like, yeah. well, <laughs> well you, you, you had a little bit of it in your DNA. So, you know, you could fake it for a year, I guess. <laughs> Exactly. But there is there there is a big difference between a guitar player and a bass player. Just because you play guitar doesn't mean you're a bass player. You might be able to play the bass, but exactly. th totally. there are rarely guitar players that are actually very good bass players too. Yeah, you know, except for maybe McCartney, you know, somebody like yeah. that. And but yeah. he plays bass differently than most bass players do. Exactly. Yeah. He's not yeah. like the regular standard bass player. No. Right. Right. He he thinks differently as well. And so. it's funny. No, that I, I had that. I had that one festival where I played, um, it was a quite a big festival, like 25,000. And um, I was booked to play, uh, I was booked on the Friday with my one band where I played the bass. And on the second day where I played the guitar with my other band on the, on the same festival. So I drove there and uh, that was the day when I really realized like how much difference it is for the hearing and the feeling and the everything. Where I was like, okay, I'm definitely a guitar player because I like that better. <laughs> Well, cool. Well, but that, and, that's and, that's funny. Go ahead, Nick. Go I, ahead. I was just going to say, there was an Instagram post that you put out the other day, and it, and, <laughs> and, and it was it from that festival because you said that literally you burned your fingers on the strings. It was so hot, right? Yes, it was not that festival, but another one in Germany. And man, I was sweating off my ass. I never had another experience like this. Um, it was literally because the sun was burning like frontal burning into our faces and um you couldn't breathe the, the minute you you started breathing it was like inhaling oven air or something it was fucked up and wow. the strings of my of my bass they heated up that crazy that i really sit i touched the strings and i got after the show i had blisters like my fingertips were burned and that was insane wow. is Man, that crazy <laughs> Where was I don't know. This? I, that that was uh, close to Stuttgart again, like between Stuttgart and Nuremberg, mm. and uh, the festival was called Out and Loud. It's a beautiful festival, and everything was nice except that moment where I realized, okay, hey Jen, this is song number four, and you got blisters on your fingertips, <laughs> and you gotta finish the fucking set. <laughs> you know, I'm telling you, man, if you're in a metal band, you want to move to Europe because those festivals happen 
all the time. Yeah. I know. They have and, a great festival scene here. Yeah, yeah and and true. everybody, you know, you don't have people getting shot and they're not burning the place down and No, you, <laughs> you just know. burn your fingertips. Burn yeah, your fingers. Exactly. <laughs> you just get cooked by the sun, but it's just such a different, um, you know, just a, vibe. a different vibe. Yes. Yeah, you know, yes. and it's like, you know, you, you're saying, oh, yeah, we played 25,000 people on this one. And then, you know, it's like, wow. It's insane. Yeah. And I'm really looking forward for this summer because we play the Grass Pop Festival in Belgium, which is enormous. It's it's huge. Wow. And uh, I played, like, I believe with all of my bands I've ever um, played with in festivals, I played probably like the top 10 of the biggest festivals in Europe. I think the biggest wow. is still Wacken, Wacken like in the oh, very Wacken. north of Germany. Yeah. That one is just crazy. You just if you're on stage, you just see people and folks until the horizon. It's just uh, <laughs> an ocean wow. of people. It's insane. It's crazy. But beautiful, beautiful, really beautiful. And and now oh. uh, just to just to kind of take off subject a little bit and go here with this, what does that cost? And are you familiar with like the like they have them here? Like Firefly has one. It's for just general admission, not even any kind of special thing. For four days, it's over three hundred dollars a person. You asked me something. I to, <laughs> I have never attended a festival as a. <laughs> well, there you go. Because <laughs> I, I, you know, I mean, they have so many of them. I can't imagine that they have the same structure that they do here in the states. You know, Jeff, it, it, it's got to be. It's got to be it's probably something like a hundred and eighty bucks or two hundred bucks for four days. In, yeah, see, but it's included big, camping and everything else. Yeah, and so that's a big oh, difference, wow. man. That's a big difference than here. Because then, it, on the, the other hand, if you have a smaller festival, like uh, it sounds ridiculous, but a smaller festival of let's say fifteen thousand, then it could be if you get a ticket for the whole weekend, it could be like just eighty bucks or something. So, well, you know, it still beats yeah. us, man. I mean, and I guess the concessions aren't as much, and well, you know. That's why they have so many of them, and 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 you guys, the audience behaves and not burn the place down. <laughs> yeah, it you know it can't be so cost prohibitive uh, for people uh, to be so successful to have that amount of festivals that they have, you know, because nobody could afford to go to one after another after another if, if it, it costs them like a, exactly. a week's paycheck or yeah, something, you know. Yeah, exactly. you know. Yeah, but then on the other hand, you know, you got to see the the dark side of the festival thing. Of course, it's cool. We have a lot of festivals in here, but. Um, I don't know if, if bands from overseas come touring here, they have a hard time because, you know, they got to co- cover their costs. So yeah, yeah. they need to put out tickets for a certain kind of price, but nobody is um, willing to pay that price for, let's say, the main act plus two opening acts. Um, if I can get 40 times more bands if I go to a festival, then. So sure, the festival sure. scene kind of kills the concert club scene in here. Oh yeah, wow. I guess you're. So, I, guess yeah, you're I mean, right. there's there, there's a lesson. Get on, get on a a, a concert touring thing, and not a uh, I mean a festival thing, and not a concert thing, because the festivals yeah. are obviously still very successful there. Of you know, course they that's, are. Yeah, oh, that's, Steel Panther man that's, that's when they go to Vakken, you know, Steel Panther at Vakken, oh. you would think they were. It was like you know. Iron Did Maiden. you see the show? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> oh, I love the guys. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's very entertaining. <laughs> so, what was the um? Let's let's go back just a little bit. What was the the first band that you ever played in and like you know made some money doing? And what what kind of material were you doing then? Um, well, I would consider the first serious band I worked with was a German power metal band by the name of Rage. Not Rage Against the Machine, but okay. Rage. And I've been I've started touring with them um, as a merchandiser. <laughs> Believe it or not, I was selling T-shirts. Um, <laughs> then um, somehow turned from merchandiser to uh, guest vocalist, um, turned into guest guitar, acoustic guitar player, and guest vocalist. And that was pretty much my first experience touring. Um, like I said, there was this one thing um, I did back in the days with GM Stevens, but I was 17 years old back then, and um, it was just a short run of four shows. But uh, exciting to be in a nightliner, like on a tour bus for the first time. It was like, oh, my God. Yeah, but 17, I shoveled to another country in a bus. <laughs> 17 years old and touring with TM Stevens. I mean, 
Come on. Yeah, man, that's, that's <laughs> that was wow. really rad, really. And um, I learned a lot from him. Um, and uh, definitely took this what I what I learned from TM back in the days. Um, took it to the to the Rage tour. Um, definitely had a lot of experience touring all over Europe with Rage. I think we did like uh, three European major European tours for like six seven weeks. Um, and then I had this other German weirdo band. Um, I love how Americans pronounce it because it's so funny. It's called Knorkator. Of course it is. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this band is, is, um, sort of, I would consider it as social, critical, fun metal. It's hard to explain because of course it's in, sang in German. So, and. The humor doesn't really translate, um, <laughs> but the thing is that the singer he sings with, with a very like young boy choir, classical choir voice, and he's half tattooed black. It's not well. like that he has like some ink pictures or I don't know something. It's just black. <laughs> he's half tattooed and just dark black. And um, yeah, that was a funny time. I joined the band in 2012, I believe. And yeah, well, now recently it's just not possible to join them on stage because I'm too busy with Evanescence. Wow. wow. That's, <laughs> I mean, and you've been with Evanescence since uh, 2015, I think I read. Exactly. The, I think it was um, August 2015, yeah. And while the announcement was taking place, I sat in Sweden um, <laughs> attending Matthias Ia Eklund's free guitar camp. Um, <laughs> and this guy is just, He's hilariously good. It's just inc insane. He's one of the most innovative and most, I don't know how to, it's innovative what he's doing in his playing. And um, I attended his guitar camp and it takes place literally in the middle of nowhere in the Swedish woods. You have to drive at least 30 minutes through the forest to get to the scouts camp. Wow. In the middle of the woods. And, um, well, I sat there. It was really cool because you, you get lessons. I was there as a student and uh, you get a lot of information for how does the music business work. And he teaches every day from, let's say, nine to nine in the evening, like crazy. And all you do in there is play guitar. That was like my summer holiday in 2015 because you don't have to worry about getting the groceries, washing the laundry and stuff and getting that shit done. You just play guitar the whole day. And um, yeah, I sat there and out of a sudden my phone, it went nuts. It went like ding, 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 ding. I was like, I'm sorry, can I go outside and check what's going on? <laughs> so that was when Evanescence announced me as a new guitar player. And literally, instantly, I, I believe like 200, 300 colleagues and, and musicians just gave me a text and say, hey, girl, congrats, you're well deserved and stuff. And it was really nice. Wow. Now, had I, I assume you had previously auditioned for them at some time? Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. Wow. <laughs> I flew. I okay, flew how into, does that work? <laughs> <laughs> I flew into New York to get to know Amy. Um, that was, and the, I think it was three days in July. And I asked her, do you want me to bring my guitar? So, you know, do you want me to audition? And seriously, she just went like, Nah, I know you can play. I saw tons of videos. And I said, mm. okay, well, then I, I do not bring a guitar. Is that correct? She was like, yeah. <laughs> so, and I get it because Amy and me, we think pretty much the same in a lot of things. So what she needed me to do was spending time with her. She needed to get to know the human being that I am, the way I think, the way I work. And... um you know, it's, it's very important because if you're on tour, you're stuck with those people in your, of your band, right? And it's not that you spend 22 hours on stage. It's just two hours on stage. And the rest of the day, the, those 22 hours, you got to get along with your bandmates. Exactly. And yeah. who the heck wants to have like a like a virtuoso of hell in on stage who's just like killing it on the instrument, but who's an asshole? Right? You don't want to sit it backstage and being like stuck to an asshole the whole time. Sure. So, sure. 
That's yeah, a guy from Sweden. Touring, touring is touring is tough and rigorous, and it shouldn't suck because of something like that. It really it should. If she that was a great idea of hers. Just so you know, she knows yeah. your talent. Get to know the person. That's genius. Exactly. I love. That. I love. That's that. what we did for three days. You know, we met up in a cafe. We had some coffee. We walked around the city. We had some dinner and we had drinks together and we talked a lot and just tried to get to know each other. And um, that was pretty smart. And I really consider her to be one of the hardest working people in the business that I've ever got to know. Really, and um, in like I said, in many things we are pretty much like twins. <laughs> It was so the nice. other day. It's so funny. I talked about because I uh, my mom gave me a little baby rat, like a pet rat, <laughs> and I named her Suki. So um, I traveled to the U.S. for another couple of rehearsal days and uh, followed by the big fall tour we just finished last in the fall. And I, I told her, it's like, hey, Amy, I got a new little baby pet rat. Take a look at her. She was like, oh, she's cute. What's her name? I said, it's Suki. She looked at me, Amy, and she was like, Seriously, my first cat was named Suki when I was 14. <laughs> well, there you <laughs> go. Like, okay, it's scary. We're some sort of soul twins or something. <laughs> or the That's cat and the rat are. Who the hell knows? That's right. <laughs> wow. So um, yeah, I want to get. I want to, of course, get into you know the your your touring rig and all that kind of stuff. But I, I've got uh, an, another interesting topic here. You opened a music school in Germany. Yes. Don't ask me how I did it. Don't ask me how I run this school. But I did. Yeah, I was just I was just going to ask you how you did it and how you run the school. Come on. Um, well, <laughs> now tell us about that. This this school. Um, I was teaching at that school before I owned it. And it was running pretty good. It's um, located in a really like another Hobbit town. It's so tiny, and it's a it's small school. It's not like a big institution where you have like hundreds of students. We have a couple of like I don't know 100, 10, 120 students. I have some teachers teaching in that school, and and uh, it's a great team. I much appreciate my teachers because they are all rock and roll. You know they. One of my drum teachers, he went to L.A. to study drums, and the other guitar player, he's teaching there. He's also playing in a very well-known German power metal band. So it's the spirit in my school is very cool, and I believe that we all give this feeling and this vibe to the students. But, of course, um, running a music school comes with a lot of stuff you actually do not want to take care about when you're, like, like I said, touring in... Tokyo like mm -hmm. after dinner in Tokyo everybody goes like okay good night and Jen sits there and takes care about a music school bank accounts you know it's it sucks being on tour but I got great help I have a great team and um well yeah it's this year is a little bit of pain in the ass for me with that school because I can't pay that much attention like I want to to that school because I'm simply not here it's mm -hmm. like today is my last day in in Germany so we're right about now to start the um, European tour and could be that I, I'll be back home in the middle of July, but could also be that I'll be back home at the end of September. So mm. it's kind of vague to talk about like when I'll be back right now and yeah, but yes, I successfully run a tiny little music school in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Well, that's that's a decent amount of students. Yeah, for I was sure. gonna say 100, you know? 110, 120 yeah. students is not a small place. Of uh, considering that you oh, know, is. an average music store, I think they get what like sixty or seventy. You know, what on, on you know, couple, yeah, but come couple on. Of I mean, and, they they just have like some rooms. I have a lot of room facilities for for all of my teachers, good. so the rooms are booked through all the week, and um, yeah. It's, it's good. It's good. We teach guitars. We teach bass. We teach drums. We teach vocals, keys, everything. And uh, what I actually really like is that the students, they start like, hey, aren't you the guy who uh, learns bass? Don't you want to meet up and we can jam a little bit? So we got like two school bands and one of our school band, it's called One Tape. Um, they now really take part in competitions like school jam competitions and stuff and they're really really fucking good <laughs> that's, that's like it. i'm proud of it excellent. it's like my oh look you my should be it's cool you should be that's <laughs> awesome 
and you know yeah. it, to have to have not not only students that are happy because when they're learning music i would assume most of them are happy but you know to be able to retain it sounds like you're able to retain your instructors and they're happy and the whole environment's you know a, you know a really happy and happy conducive and to learning and healthy and conducive to learning environment and yeah that's man that's great congratulations thank you very you know. much yeah, yeah, we can't, you know, we're, we're losing, I don't know about your, you know, in, in Europe, but we're losing so much music in the schools here. They're just completely taking it all away. And it's, it's really important for, for kids to be able to get involved with music if they want to. And even yeah. if they're not sure that they want to at least have the opportunity to taste it a little bit and, exactly. you know, to, to see if, if it sparks something, you know, and we're exactly. losing so much of that in this country. It's yeah, really but the, sad. You know, like the, like the primary school and stuff, they, they stop teaching music as well. That's why I see myself in charge really? of her. Come on guys here, kid, put your kids into my school. And, and it's really, I had the other day, a very beautiful um, thing that happened. Um, a mother of a student that I'm teaching now, because I'm teaching two days a week, there are two. Uh, when I'm in Germany. <laughs> um, so I have this student, he's like, he started taking lessons when he was six years old and he's like 12, 13 now, I believe. And um, when he started uh, taking lessons, his mom was like, okay, listen, Jen, my son, he has cancer. And I was like, okay. So yeah, um, well, you know, um, it's sometimes he really needs to go to chemo and stuff and then he's not available. Is there something we can do about the contract? And I was like, yeah, of course, come on. I mean, it's mm. not the kid's fault. That is horrible. Right. So like a few, a couple of months ago, that same mom, she came to me and she was like, can I talk to you? Usually that means, oh shit, I did something wrong. I'm in trouble. The kid was crying <laughs> or something. But she came up to me and she gave me some flowers and she said, you know what? I want to say thank you because from the very first moment my son took lessons, guitar lessons with you, he never ever had a chemo, he never ever had cancer problems again. It seems like everything is fine now. What? That's crazy. And I was like, that Whoa. is crazy. And she talked to, to Dr. and was like, yeah, it can happen if you're really fulfilled with happiness and something you really want to do and it can happen in that particular certain age and state of cancer that he had and it seems he's healed wow and that was man. like i i started crying immediately i was i was that was such an emotional beautiful moment i even start crying now <laughs> that was really beautiful yeah that's amazing yeah that is kind yeah. of wild you know people don't realize how powerful music is exactly. it truly is it truly is oh, it, yeah. it moves it moves molecules in your body and that that exactly. does things Wow. Exactly. Yeah. Just ask Carlos. He'll tell you about it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So that, that is awesome. Man, wow. Yeah. You've accomplished yeah. so much already. That's, already. that's phenomenal. I'm just yeah. 800 years old, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Far from it. Far from it. You, um, Man, I feel like we're talking just lifestyle and, and just nothing. And usually it goes like, what's your, what's the guitars you're playing? How's your life set up? Like, it's like, what the heck, guys? <laughs> well, we always try to get to know yeah. our guests. You know, it's nice. it's much more about the people than it is about the gear. And we'll we'll get we'll ask you questions about the gear, of course. Yes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's we try to get a very, very well rounded representation of the person that we're speaking with. That is very beautiful. Much so. appreciated. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, I uh, I also read that you did a little bit of work with Lizzie Hale. You did something with her. No. Oh. Interesting. What did you read? <laughs> um, wow, I don't know now. I'm gonna have uh, to get I back. never, I never mm -hmm. met Lizzie. I mean, we really? we sent some messages back and forth, but we never actually talked and met. I guess the girl you're talking about is Nita Strauss of Ellis Cooper. Well, well, we've had Nita on as we, a guest. Yeah, and you're also friends with Gretchen. So yeah, Gretchen. yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, she knows most of the people we've interviewed, Jeff. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's, a, it's a tiny little, tiny little pond of female musicians, you know. Oh, yeah. And, uh, Gretchen and me were planning, actually, to do a classical video together. But uh, it's just some wind happening because right now I am at least so busy with touring and recording and stuff. Um that I that I just don't have the time to do it. But we talked it through. We have the, we picked the piece, 
And uh, whenever there's a time, maybe for Christmas or something, and we really want to make it happen, it would be beautiful. That'd be cool. Nice. Okay, well, well. speaking of, of recording and touring, we, I guess we can get into that a little bit. Um, have you, yes, sir. <laughs> ha, have you uh, recorded anything with, uh, and excuse me, but I'm not familiar. I didn't, I didn't do that much research. Did you uh-huh. record anything with Evanescence yet? Is, are you on uh, an Evanescence release since 2015? I will be recording, but we haven't been to studio yet. So okay, what cool. we tracked so far, and it just, I don't know, I think Amy sent the, the email that we're finished with uh, the orchestra recording a couple of days ago for uh, the new project we are going to release hopefully in fall. And um, it's something totally different and something very interesting for me personally because I never had the chance to try out so many new things as it's going to be... Um, like she put out a video where she explains about it and she explains it so much better than I ever could. Um, it's the idea is to take Evanescence songs and strip them down just to vocals and the core of the song and um, fully reorchestrate the songs plus modern sounds, meaning samples and cool sounds and like everything very electronically and, um, of course, it's it's not going to be like the full rock guitars on there, because mm-hmm. it's a different attitude if you work with an orchestra. I mean, you well, you can do it like, for example, Metallica did it, just be a rock band and have a symphony orchestra attached to your mm-hmm. back, but that's not how we're going to do it. We're going to work it out in a very new, interesting way. And um, yeah, it's very exciting because it's, it's, it's just right now, it's getting created and it's being built right now so i can't really say how it's going to sound in the end because i haven't been in studio yet i will be um all i know so far is uh, she tracked piano and orchestra and uh yeah it's very wow. interesting definitely because i'm going to try out new things i've never did and i showed it the other i won't mention what i'm doing but i tried something out and i was like man this shit is rad i want to do that i can't so far but i gotta learn how to do that and i sent a video to her and she was like oh my god this is insane let's do this so it's really <laughs> it's cool I, i'm not going to say anything um but it's very very cool and i believe that some people probably haven't even seen this thing what i'm going to do Wow. So it's something very new, something very interesting. And I'm just, I'm totally on fire for that one. It's, it's exciting. Man. Well, now I can't wait to hear <laughs> yeah, it. I'm like, may, maybe, <laughs> maybe hopefully see it, you know? <laughs> yeah. We'll be touring, um, uh, during, uh, September or somewhere. I mean, the dates are not locked down yet, mm-hmm. so it's just, everything is open, but we're going to tour with this. Yep. Nice. And you'll be over nice. here. You'll be in the, in the U S um, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. I, well, I, I think we're doing just the U.S. So I'm not really involved, and I, I don't really know the the tour schedule because it's just being built. And mm. um, I, but I believe September, like fall, there's going to be a tour mm. in the U.S. Cool, nice. We'll definitely yeah. keep our eyes open for that yeah. one. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Give me a call, All right. so you can come to the show. Perfect. <laughs> awesome, awesome. All right, so now you know I'm I'm going to back up a little bit again, and we're gonna, we're going to we're going to go do a little gear talk, but like, we're going to go back to your first things. Like, do you remember what your first guitar was? Do you still yes. have it? No, it was no. a horrible instrument. It was <laughs> awkward. It was, <laughs> it was, it was a German, very old traditional German company called Honer. Um, sure. Well, I'm familiar with Honer. Oh, yeah, we're oh familiar you know that. So you, yeah. so you know what they usually built. They, they're not a guitar company, right? <laughs> We do like yeah, they're, they're, folk instruments and stuff. And, um, and harmonicas and, you know. Exactly. Yeah. So that company um, was responsible for my first guitar in pink. <laughs> Don't ask me. It's, it's, it, it's been a horrible instrument. So I realized that pretty fast after a couple of months. I was like, no. So my dad bought me a classical Fender Stratocaster, right? <laughs> so I wow. played a little bit on that one, but... Um, the first guitar I ever bought for myself when I went to the music store and sat there, I don't know, for for weeks every day and tried out, I believe, every guitar they had um, was an Ibanez. 
I got um, from the S series, the S forty four seventy. Yeah. And uh, that was my very first guitar that I bought, and I still have it. I love that guitar. It's it looks totally beaten because I played so many shows with it, and it broke several times and. I had it repaired and I sent it to Ibanez and I was like, guys, ah, somebody at Wacken broke the head from the neck. You know, it just, it was just broken. It's like, could wow. you fix it to me? Please fix it because I love this guitar. And they were like, yeah, um, Jen, um, do you want us to fix anything else? This guitar pretty much looks like shit. And it's like, nope, that's history. <laughs> Leave everything. Just, just that's fix great. the guitar and, and I can play it again. And they did a great job. <laughs> and here, here's, awesome. here's one thing that I have, uh, through our interviews, but also uh, like Greg Mara's podcast, he has talked to a couple of the Ibanez guys there. That is one of those companies that for years they were just kind of copying guitars. Now, this was before the RG series came out. Then right. they mm-hmm. then they signed Steve Vai and right. the RG series and the S series. And they really they really just amped that company to no end. But the thing about them is how they take their designs and you can see it over the years um and they they it's whatever happens out on the road they go back and they kind of retool to make sure that hey you know we have a problem with headstock snapping off when they when Mm -hmm. they drop so they went in and they added a volute you know to add more strength Mm -hmm. to it and they're not one of these companies that will sit on their loins and and you know kind of like no we're not going to change they're Just always totally kind of not. reinventing I think, I think their stuff to make it a little bit better for the road or for the, you know, for the average Reinventing musician. plus the fact that they are actually innovative. I mean, Ibanez came up with those seven strings. Either oh, yeah. you play them or you don't. I mean, seven strings have been like a revolution in guitar playing, plus followed by those eight strings. And I don't know which number we're on now, like 10 strings or something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't follow that. I can't do that. Um, I play in a seven string in, in Evanescence and I play baritone guitars. Um, oh, nice. But that's pretty much it, really. I, I can't. I started laughing if I take a look at my tiny hands on an eight string <laughs> guitar. It's just ridiculous. I can't do that. Well, yeah. I mean, even, Vi, even a seven. Even a seven. Yeah. You know? Vi, Vi was the guy that, you know, the universe yeah. is the very first ones and they, they exactly. failed miserably. I mean, it was really, really bad. It just kind of came out and it went away. Now, he wrote Passion of Warfare, and that album, you know, right. had a ton of seven string on it. But it wasn't until Korn, when Korn went exactly. and bought Korn those guitars. Korn established the seven string sounds. That's exactly. where it was, man. They were the ones yeah. who put it on the market. And then everybody. I mean, it went just ballistic after that. And then they started remaking the Steve Vai models again. Exactly. Did you see the the anniversary uh, Passion of Warfare guitars? Oh my God, they are mm. so beautiful. No, I haven't seen them. I, I I know that they did. You know, I mean he he really set the you know he he put that company on the map. Him and Joe Satriani. I mean they were totally the two yeah. first totally guys. Totally. And yeah, once it yeah, I love Satch's guitar too. Oh yeah, and really you know cool. that model yeah. they got rid of the model. They only have the. The Satriani model, but that was exactly. called the, that was called yeah. the Radius. Yeah, that was huh. actually an R model that they had, and it didn't work as a line. But when they put Joe's name on it, it went crazy, <laughs> and of rightfully course. so. Well, that's you how know, the business works, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's, it's, sometimes it does. Yeah, yeah well, I got out. a, I got a, I got a jam too. I got the universe, and I got the jam, and this, I got the new blue floor pattern that they put out there like yes. oh, one cool. or two years ago. God, guys, and I, I believe this is the this is the moment which is called the the breakthrough moment where I really was like, that is my guitar. Um, I don't, I can't really explain what it is, but as soon as I like take that guitar, it's just one. It's it's it feels like one entire system. It's not like a person playing an instrument, which is a piece of wood with strings. It's it's totally phenomenal, interesting. But I love that guitar so much, and uh, I hardly play another guitar in in germany when i teach or when i play shows and here smaller ones and with evanescence it's a little bit different because we need a lot of wood meaning we have a lot of different tunings Mm. a Mm. lot and by a lot i really mean a lot but um it's it's simply not possible to play an evanescence show with one guitar Mm, right Um, let's say you play like a cool riff and then amy goes like hmm 
can we play it half step lower and your riff is an E? What the heck are you supposed to do? You gotta grab another guitar then. So um, it's it's a lot, a lot of wood, but I'm very happy that I started working with the Helix pedal board from Line 6 mm. because wow. um, that saved me a lot of this wood because I can do the pitch and tunes and everything um, on the pedal board. Really? Which is awesome. I, I really started my first tour with Evanescence having what was it like nine guitars for one show and now i could easily handle it with three or four guitars that is i really much appreciate the really? pitch function in the pedal board <laughs> and it, and it tracks that fast that you can actually yes. play it yes it's wow awesome. on an analog I'm, pickup I'm that's happy. not even midi right nope holy oh, well you can probably yeah i'm sure right. you could probably plug midi in but so but I don't a, do that. I'm old school. That is crazy, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, well, the, uh, if I'm not mistaken, PV did something like that a few years ago, maybe even five, six years ago, uh, where the guitar um, would actually play to pitch no matter how the strings were tuned. Was that PV or was that um, back in the days already Line 6 with the very X guitar? Well, I they think, got the Variax, I, and now they got the Shuriken, which is the craziest. I saw a presentation of that guitar um, during this year's NAMM show in January, mm -hmm. and it's fucking insane. You can actually like mute strings. Um, wow. <laughs> you can you can tune and pitch the strings the way you want them to be. If stuff is too heavy to play for your fingers, so you can jump around and play everything with one finger because you just make the strings change the tuning. That it's fucking so insane. <laughs> wow. Then, on the other hand, I don't insane. know. I don't know how much that has to do with guitar playing. I mean, if we got gear that makes everything easy and comfortable for us, where is the really cool guitar player who sat down on his ass practicing hours and hours, and where is the tone going, you know? Well, I, I think, you know, we've had this discussion. <laughs> There's, you can, fool, you can fool people so far, but eventually, you know... There, you'll be able to see through it a little bit. I mean, you know, there. look, uh, I made a joke about Ingve Mountstein earlier. <laughs> you guys didn't hear it <laughs> when yes. you said you got this asshole. And <laughs> I, I said, heard you. We were back in Sweden. Yeah, but anyway, like Swedish guy. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's something about his vibrato that, you know, yes. you just can't. There's no machine that can yeah, duplicate it's that. Right. You know, right. Right. Uh, it, and regardless of whether you like him, you don't like him or you like his music or you don't, that is it. That guy can make a, a set of nines or a set of eights. <laughs> I'm sorry. A set of eights yeah. on a Stratocaster sound bigger than the wall of marshals that he walks around with. And yeah. it's like yeah. that is something that is not capable of being done outside of those right. hands exactly. yeah. you know right, right. Yeah. and you can't model it you can't program it you can't it's yeah just it's so, natural okay. talent so i think the oh, thing yeah. is is that there's a lot of computer generated music but our ears regardless of whether you know it's real or not there's something about our ears that kind of lick it that we kind of shake it off it it's kind of cool totally, at first but I then totally it kind of goes away yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah 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 totally agree with you and the really good quality is just sticks I know. Yeah, yeah, I know absolutely. what you mean. Yeah, totally. I mean, you know, they can have all the computers in the world uh, reproduce the Stradivarius, but it's that violin that that will, you know, in yeah. front right, of you right. that can't be reproduced. You know, it's it, it's close, right. but it it'll never be right. Right. I'm not a big fan of amp modeling and stuff, so I play this incredible Helix pedal board with all those Line Six effects and and amp simulations and stuff. I just use the effects. And I would never change my setup because I love my angle Powerball amps. They're just the greatest. And I always play, you know, through the amp and just use the effects off the pedal board nice. in a fixed loop. Yeah. Well, there you go, oh, Jeff. You, I mean, I, I was playing in an ACDC <laughs> tribute band for years. And my setup, like all the guitar players who tried to play on my guitar when I, when I got ready for the ACDC show, they were like, how the heck can you play on this? It's just guitar, tuner, amp. There was nothing. I I didn't even have like a like a mm, nom 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 delay. Nothing. It was just so farty dry. It was like totally hard to play on that setup. But I guess it was a good school because yeah, if you got the 
if you get the sound of what you play like really smashed into your face, there's no chance of hiding behind a delay or something. And you oh, really sure. learn to play very accurate. <laughs> so probably <laughs> that was a good thing. <laughs> oh, absolutely. It, it, if the, the more simple the rig is, um, the better you get pretty quickly. You know, or well, you don't have or an you option, just, or 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 you yeah, you don't have an option, or you just stop playing, or you go back for the toys again. You know, yeah, uh, right. But uh, you know, a right. good clean rig will make you a better player fast. Oh, le- yeah. You right. know, there's at least you would hope it would. There's tons of video where you can hear Angus uh, make mistakes because I mean, you really think about that rig, right? There was very little gain. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> oh yeah. That cat was you know flopping on the floor like a fish. <laughs> But there's there's no uh, you know Hopping there's no on the floor like a fish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I had to... oh, what a great visual! What a great visual! <laughs> but there's there's no delay there to cover up a bad note, and <laughs> if if you're yeah. if you don't play a note, there's no note there. You yeah, know? it's like there's you nothing have to repeat. To properly fill you you have to properly fill the space, exactly. you know, and that takes a talent and that. I tell you what, man, he, he rarely, rarely ever repeats himself during a solo. You're and right. I don't know that's how true. that's possible. That's I don't know how that's, that's possible with only so many notes and so many phrases in, in, in pentatonic world, you know? Pentatonic, right? Yeah. 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 That's it, the thing, though, yeah. God, he could play for he could play for ten minutes and not repeat a phrase almost. It's yeah, crazy. And, and he had that that's thing true. that um that Paul Kosoff the did was uh, you know, he could shake a note. And it was like a fast vibrato, but it was in such a way that if you ever try to do it, it's really kind of not easy. And I don't no. know if it's at if it's at plain setup, maybe because you know a lot of times they would no, shake it, those notes to try to make them sustain longer. Sure, <laughs> you know, sure. And, and it all depends that's on what kind of how it started with him. Probably, yeah, I don't yeah. think so because uh, his vibrato is like no other vibrato. I I don't know any other guitar player that sounds like Angus Young does. And uh, I truly believe that he tried to just sustain the note, and that's how his shaky sort of vibrato started. Yeah, totally. Kosoff was the same way and free, man. I mean, you, you watch some of those whole videos of him. He's standing he's a foot away from a full stack. <laughs> yeah, right. and he's just strangling the neck. <laughs> it's like, man. And it, and it all, it all depends because there are different types of vibrato. Everybody has a, a different hand yes. movement for their vibrato. You My know, vibrato I mean, sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I, if I consider myself being not good in something, it's um, I believe it's my vib- vibrato, which is really not cool for my taste. Um, plus, I I totally suck in those in those um, sweeping things. I can mm. pretend that I could be do that uh, could do that, but I I really I can't. So I realized like, okay, Jen, focus on that stuff you can, and try to get into that. And skip all the stuff you will never be able to do. So I really appreciate um, and like to listen to music of guitar players. Like, I don't know. I don't want to mention any names, but there are a lot of guys out there doing great arpeggio work and sweepings. But I, I suck in that. <laughs> it, well, it's it good to know a, your limitations. You know? Yeah, <laughs> and it takes a. It believe me, I've I've tried it, and I my brain doesn't register it. I don't know why. Uh, and the brain doesn't work that fast. <laughs> it's kind of weird, right? I mean, you gotta you gotta hit a note and let go of it without you you know you got to make them all ring individual. And I see guys do it at blazing. Herman Lee can do can. Oh, sleep I recently pick. met Herman because he was at the oh, wow. Frankfurt Music Fair and uh, we did a guitar camp together. Uh huh. And uh, every interview he did, <laughs> it was so funny. Every interview he did, the guys were like. Oh my God! This is the action, the actual string action on your guitar. That's so low. That's the lowest I've ever seen. And he's like, "Nah, it's not that low. It's for me, it's normal." <laughs> <laughs> and that was really funny. And we we got to hang out a lot. And he's a really cool guy. We got That's to meet funny. him at. Remember, Jeff? We met him at the Nam party. Uh, uh, oh right, the year at we the, went. At the, uh, was that the guitar player? I think yes. it was the guitar player yeah. party. Yeah, yeah, by the pool. Yeah, the pool. yeah. And, you know, I was asking him a thousand questions in five minutes and he was like, yeah, I'm going to go back to my drink. (laughs) Nobody ever left their drink there. Trust me. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) That was a very fun night. So you use the angle Powerball, huh? 
that's where I was yes, going to go. Yeah. I thought so, Jeff. That's why I did that. I'm, I'm working with Angle since, I don't know, 100 years already now. And um, <laughs> I much appreciate the very direct sound they have. And plus, um, I started out with a Fireball, which is an easy rock and roll amp. If you're touring, playing ACDC, it's a perfect amp. But the older you get, the more, you know, you want to have a diversity of sounds and um, op- just... Yeah, sounds because I much appreciate the the clean channel, which is I could use for funk stuff or um, even in in um, uh, in the Evanescence set we have some some parts where I play the clean guitar and most of my sounds. Think about it. <laughs> most of most of the songs I play in Channel Three, the rhythm uh, gain channel, it's, it's just awesome. It's very dry. It's very direct, and I like that. I like that a lot. Plus, Angle has developed a very cool, for my taste, a very cool way to work with mid frequencies. Mm. Because you know the mm. usual metal amps, they go like they sound like a, and mm. it's too many high frequencies and too much low bottom, and it's that's not really what goes through. So if you work as a guitar player in a band, the low bottom end is kick drum and it will just eliminate your mighty sound that you might create it when you play alone. But um, I believe when you're a guitar player in a, in a rock band, you should focus on the frequencies that are there for your instrument, probably the mid frequencies. And Engel had, had found out a way to really work those mid frequencies in a, for me and my taste, perfect way. You don't know how many times we've had this discussion and oh, it's exactly good. it's exactly what we've been saying yeah. all along. A guitar is a mid-range instrument and that's exactly. where you belong in the mix. You totally. know, the bottom end is kick drum, it's bass guitar, the top end is cymbals and maybe the top exactly. end of a keyboard or something like that. Exactly. Stay where you belong and you'll be heard. Oh, let me you tell know? you. Totally, totally. You know, you want a guitar to disappear. <laughs> just take that yeah. mid-range knob and turn exactly. it down and you turn will it become to zero and right yeah, you'll become vapor you'll be muted yeah <laughs> yeah yeah totally. uh, but that's, that's that's true then even if you play alone and it might sound like a little weird for your own taste as soon as the band kicks in you'll be heard because oh, the yeah. mid freak mid frequencies are are the thing that is heard yeah so yeah. See, well, this girl knows. She and, knows. And, and, you know, I, I always use this as an example, and I don't know if I ever told you this, Jeff. Um, all the Black Label Society stuff, if you mm. really listen to those albums, I mean, they're JCM 800s. You know, they're his own signature head, but they're based off of the 800. Mm-hmm. If you listen to those albums, it's very mid-range. It's just sure. the way that, that, you know, they got a bass player that's got a heavy sound to him. And the way they mix it, it comes across, you know, with this heavy bottom end. But the guitars are right there where you like them, right in that mid-range, right where. And and believe me, you you can hear Zach Wild, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's. It, well, you look, you, you're you're preaching to the choir here, you know. That's it, guitar is a mid-range <laughs> instrument, and that's yep. where it is. And um, wow, I'm Jen. I'm glad you. I'm glad you understand that and you get that because I I think it really. It's important uh, for a band to have a guitar player that realizes that. Totally. You know, because I mean, that's that your guitar will stand out in that mix now. And if they if they totally, if they yeah. love what you do, then they want their audience to hear what you do, and that's that's how that happens. So good exactly. on you. Yeah. Good on you. <laughs> now you know, and there's extremes to everything, right? Like Johnny Winter, he never had bass or mid range; he just had all treble. And uh, totally. uh, through yes. twins, Defer he got the, well. Music man's. Oh, that's right. That. I'm sorry, music yeah. man's, yeah. which is even yeah, worse. The, def- <laughs> the, the Defer he got, the more trouble there was. Yeah. So you know, uh, but and, and I, I always use references, and and one of the references is you listen to "Unleashed in the East" by Judas Priest. That mm-hmm. is the greatest yeah. mid ranging sound metal guitars you probably will ever hear recorded. Because it just sounds yeah. like a, a, a cocked wah, you know, like they mm-hmm. hit it and they just yeah. let it go. Sort of like the Scorpions. Yeah. The Scorpions are known for that, too. Yeah, I'll check all, this all... out because we're going to co-headline with, for the Scorpions in June. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. 
So, uh, Jen, have you put out anything solo that our yes, listeners would like to know about? Um, I recorded my first solo album in 2013 in the summer, and um, it's out there. You can find it on CD Baby and everywhere. Um, but I'm actually very excited these days because I'm going to be in the studio second half of August and record my second solo album. Um, nice. Learn, learn from sort of the mistakes I did with my first album. So my attitude right now for the second solo album is pretty much, I won't listen to any one of you business guys trying to tell me how to do my music. I just give a fuck about it. I just do the music the way I want it. And if I want to have one album with an acoustic song and one instrumental song and pop songs and metal and deathcore shouts, then I do this. So it's going to be very um, interesting. Um, The title is going to be Insanity. (laughs) <laughs> Pretty much nice. because I found my my inner zen with the piece that I realized that it's not too bad if you're insane, right? So I can listen to pop music the same amount like I listen to Lamb of God sh- stuff. And um, it's it's not terrible to make a mixture out of those two styles if it feels good for you. Sure. So it's definitely I mean, I'm it, very I'm very very excited about reporting this one because I'm going to have awesome guest musicians just to oh, name cool. a few who agreed to play a guest solo on it it's going to be Alex Golnick mm. and uh, Jeff Waters and my Swedish friend Matthias Ia Eklund they're going to be on the record too and uh, it, it will be a, like a cool variety of interesting different styles I believe and um, that that I'm really looking forward to yeah that's, That's cool. awesome. And, and and your your other album uh, was released uh, May 11th in 2015, and that is on iTunes for our <laughs> iTunes people out there. So oh, cool. Uh, yes. And uh, you can get that for a cool $9.99. Awesome. Some, uh, <laughs> That's great. Um, anything else we forgot, Jen? Any, any endorsements? Any? Uh, oh, God, any, guys, I could forgot? go on forever. I think I'm the queen of endorsement deals. I, at least I feel like it. <laughs> I even, I even, um, I, I, I even got an endorsement for clothes. So it's um, Ibanez guitars, oh, Angle man. amps, Line Six wireless system, and Helix pedal board. The Dario strings, cordial cables, Richter straps. Um, in your communication, a small Germany from uh, a small company from Germany. Oh, nice. For my in ears and uh, painkiller clothing. Um, it's a little girl in uh, in the UK. She's doing my stage pans and stuff. And the latest is Matt Hatter Guitar Product. It's a guy from Phoenix called Ed Heisler. And he rewired my guitar. He, I gave him, it was a pretty painful moment for me because I never gave my blue jam away, but I did it. And he traveled away. It was during NAMM we met up and he told me what he's about to do with my guitar. And I was like, yeah, okay. So I gave him my guitar, stayed a few couple of days more in LA and he came back and brought me my guitar back. And... Um, I'll never forget that. Uh, he brought me that guitar back. So what? literally what he did, he put in the Terminator kit. Um, and it's like a, it's complicated to explain. The easiest way to explain it is I got a push-pull podi now. It's the yin-yang podi. Pot, and um, you just can turn your five-way switch into a ten-way switch because it gives you the, the option to um, make the neck pickup or the middle pickup or the whatever, you can make the pickup sound more intense like it should sound with just pulling that pody. And mm. it's really something pretty rad. I much appreciate it, and I can't wait to, to just really check it out in studio when I'm recording. Really? Um, and that is so funny because he came there and he brought, he had his, he had my guitar in his car, and we had lunch together, and I was like so thankful because he offered to help me with this and do this. I was like, damn, this is so awesome. Yeah, you know, um, I just fixed the Vice Evo. What the nice. heck? Did you, what? So Steve right. Vai gave him Evo. Wow. And he put the same Terminator kit into Steve Vai's Evo. So after the lunch, when we went to his car, he opened up his car and he was like, yeah, here's your guitar. Um, thank you very much for trusting me with your guitar. And I was like, okay, what are the two other guitars you have in there? <laughs> oh, well, would you want to take a look? And then... It was Woody and Flo, the original ones. Good God. And I was like, God, can I touch them? Wow. It's like insane. And he was like, yes, <laughs> Dave was so 
happy with with my work I did on Evo. So he immediately gave me Flo and Woody to do the same thing. And I'm actually driving now to Steve's place and we're meeting up. Wow. Holy crap. And I was like, okay, you, what, what are you saying now is like, I got the same Terminator kit <laughs> like Steve Weiss, Evo, and Flo, and Woody. And Woody. Oh, and there he you was go. like, yeah. Man, that was That's... something awesome. So really. you don't have to put a battery in the <laughs> guitar, do you? No. No, it's, oh. it's just rewired um, pickups. How the hell are they, they doing that, Jeff? I, I don't know. I don't know about this mod you can yet. Find yeah. A very interesting video. It's uh, by a friend of mine. His name is Anthony Garone. He does. Um, uh, he has a YouTube channel called Make Weird Music. And there's a whole documentation about how they worked with Steve Vai's Evo and how they what they changed and what they did. Really, and it's really cool to watch. Totally. Well, we'll wow. have to we'll have to check that out, and if I remember, because you know these days I, I don't remember much, I'll I'm put that on the website. <laughs> Well, I'll hear well, it when I produce the show, but I always forget yes, to do it true. at the end. <laughs> um, it's just really for cool. the record, make weird music. Steve Vai, Terminator Kid. There you, there go. you go. There, there you, go. you go. Now, just uh, <laughs> one, one added note here, because you're such a Steve Vai mm-hmm. fan, I, I, I'll share this with you. Back in the day mm-hmm. when they started the whole promotion behind the Gem Series, I actually yeah. owned number 37 of the <gasps> Green Loch Ness uh, oh no way! Yeah, that oh was signed. God. That was signed by him, and I have oh pictures. <laughs> I have pictures of it. So uh, I'll try to remember to send them to you, but I will also try to remember to put them up with the show so everybody can check them out. Uh, oh, I never really? played the guitar That's more rad. than just a couple times. I used it as an investment, and I bought my first big rig with it after about five years of owning it. <laughs> I should wow. have kept the guitar. Do you regret it now? <laughs> you know. Um, would I have ever played it live? It, no, because it was Probably signed. Not. It was a whole thing. There was only 777 made worldwide. Right, and right. There's like mm-hmm. a registry. And I've seen some of them go for as high as 20 grand. And, um, oh, of course. And like the low number ones, there's a lot of them that are gone, like destroyed. Like they guys used them, they wow. played them, and they're just done. And played them to death. Yeah. yeah, you know, just broke them or whatever, and and the value was gone out of them. And it would have been cool, yeah. But I'm not a guitar collector, so you know, I just I took some pictures and I was like, well, I owned it. There you go. Nice. I don't I don't think I've seen those pictures, so I'm gonna no, have to see no. them too. It, it was, now you gotta upload the pictures. Yeah, everyone wants to see that. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. They they kept making the pink and the yellow one for a long time, but that one was a very limited run, and now they actually re-released it. I think they released it in green exactly. again. Yeah. Wow. Well, it's green, uh, yellow, and pink. Yeah. All the colors are are back, and it's. I played them during this year's NAMM show. That's when I ran into Steve the last time, and um, these guitars are fabulous. This is insane. I I'm really just a fan of jam, of the jam series. It's I can't put it in any other way and i really much appreciate the way ibanez guitars feel play wise in general because you know I, everybody loves the sound of a the mighty big bottom sound of a les paul but seriously i'm a girl i can't handle that heavyweight guitar <laughs> i i like the sound but i can't play it it's just and the neck is just too thick for my taste and so i really found with ibanez i believe the perfect fit for me and i'm i really consider to to stay with them until i die or <laughs> nice well you know you find yeah. that thing and it's and you yeah you know yeah. if you try to deviate from it 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 affects you of course you know? yeah well you said, yeah, your you, way of playing of course yeah you said you started with a, a strat if i remember correctly and then you went over to to the ibanez and exactly. i'm just thinking that uh you're somebody that prefers um, a flatter fretboard, like a flatter radius. Yeah. Um, yes, a fretboard. but, and, and but they do that the well. Super, the super wizard necks. To be honest, they are too flat. It feels like holding a business card if you play the guitar. Then it's too too <laughs> wow. thin. Wow. Yeah, they're very it's thin. So ridiculously thin, and yeah. and I feel even if it's maybe maybe it's not true, but I I from my heart I feel like the the sound is suffering from the very thin necks. Mm-hmm. So I like it a little bit, you know, the the jam that I have, the Blue Flora Pattern, it's, it's actually from the Premium Series. Um, the Premium Series have bigger necks, yes. the other ones, but due to the fact that it's a jam, 
it's again slightly thinner and this neck in my taste is just perfection but they I, I don't really know if they still build these kind of rg prestige necks that i have in my older rgs because nowadays everything is about that super wizard flatter yeah. flatter flatter kind of the neck yeah. shape and i'm not a big fan of this but I, i've seen know. i've seen some of the blogs on the uh the new uh prestige series and some of the guys are complaining because they are very thin and it's not a, thing is, it's not a state st- if you have stability thing either it's just it's too thin yeah the thing is if you work with a very thin neck shape it means you have the regular like thin neck shape but not the super thin but they just make it flatter and flat and flatten and flatten it. So there comes an edge on the on the I don't know on the on the back of the neck where you have your thumb when you play, and there's like a tiny little edge that can turn into be very uncomfortable when you play uh. pentatonic bluesy stuff and bendings and stuff. It's just a tiny little edge, a corner on top of the backside of the neck, and that happens when you flatten the neck too much. So either you like it or you don't, and I'm. I can play it, but I prefer much more, a little bit more wood. Nice. Yeah, man. Yeah, I guess I guess the flatter, the faster. Everybody's going for f- ultra fast, and I don't know. I can't play that way. I have no idea what it takes to play that See, way. See, that's so. why, I, why I suck in sweepings. I play the wrong guitar ness. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, that's it. You solved my problem. <laughs> there you go. You got to talk to Herman next time you see him. <laughs> yeah <laughs> actually i i checked out his guitar and um because we traded guitars he was like oh let me play your jam and i was like okay let me play yours and um it's not that flat it it is flat it's a typical ibanez neck but it's not i didn't feel uncomfortable when i played it it was yeah. like it's, it felt okay mm-hmm. it was more like the it's it, because he plays the uh he has a signature model of the s series as yeah. well yeah. so i mean i have an s series so it's pretty much the neck of the s series from what I was used to with my guitar at home, but you know, it's not a super wizard neck that he has with his guitar. <laughs> super wizard. The super oh. wizard. <laughs> well, we'll see how long the long they last, and uh, you know, lightning speed, fast playing. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes right. you can say more with one note. So. <laughs> yes, there's a guy named Absolutely. Buddy Guy who does it all the time. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, Jen, thank you so much for for taking the time. I know this is um, it's probably pushing your limits because you're off uh, and running on tour tomorrow. So yeah, I'm but sure I'm totally gotta... fine. Thank you guys for oh, the good. for the nice time and for the great talk. Absolutely. Oh yeah, man. I'm good. Well, uh, have a great tour. Safe travels. Uh, we'll keep an eye out for when you are in the uh, the northeast of the U.S. somewhere. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And hopefully we can come out and uh, and check out the show. We'd love to meet you in person. Totally. Like I said, just give me a call. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and it's that okay, easy. Okay, guys. All right, Jen. All right. Thank you so very much. Have a great rest of the day. Safe travels. Wonderful tour. And uh, all the best to you. And there you have the story. Yeah, that's a uh, man. What a life. <laughs> yeah, she, you know, she she had the opportunity to start early. Yeah. You know, like. Uh, 17 and and Mm. on stage in front of tens of thousands of people and you you know uh, our audience because i can see where most of our audience is it's mostly in the states here i mean mm. we're all over the world because obviously the internet but i want everybody that's you know that's here in the states that doesn't know what happens overseas because a lot of times we kind of you know, we get a little pigeonholed with our own selves and we think, oh, this is it. And it's really not. There's like this. No, and, we, and we've touched on this before. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> but I want you to know that when uh, she says they did like a, you know, six to seven week European tour, like, you know, three, four times. That's a major feat, man. There is a lot of property <laughs> in Europe and uh, yeah, yeah. You're, you're covering pretty large territories and huge audiences i mean when they organize these things these guys are pros at this stuff with having these festivals and you know mm-hmm. and i remember i remember right out of high school my buddy was in the military and he came back and he was like yeah man uh monsters of rock they have it over there every year and i'm like you're kidding because you know they had just had the metallica one with van halen and all 
oh, right, right. here in the in this country. And he goes, no, nah, man, they used to have them all the time. And I'd be like, well, who would play? And he goes, oh, Judas Priest, ACDC, White Snake, Iron Maiden. I'm like, all on the same stage? <laughs> and he's like, yeah. I'm like, these are the biggest groups on the planet, and <laughs> you could see them all in one weekend. I was I was taken back by it, you know? Yeah. And, it, I mean, it's, all, it's also very cool uh, over in Europe, too, because you can literally – jump in a tour bus mm-hmm. and play play 10 different countries yeah, absolutely you know <laughs> all on land you can just yeah. jump in a bus and literally play 10 different countries exactly it's, it's fantastic yeah and the whole club scene you know like she said the club scene's suffering a little bit so uh you know definitely any of our european guys you know keep that alive man because it's dying here too yeah yeah for sure I mean, I, we, I I still do know people that are or have have gone and are leaving all the time for uh, for European tours, small European tours. You know, whether it's a, a couple of weeks or a month or something like that. Sure. But um, they're 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 still happening. Um, you know, it's uh, there's no huge fame and fortune in it, no. but they are still happening on a very regular basis, um, even as far as cover bands go. Yeah. Well. So it's um, I love it. You know, it's it's still there if if you can if you have the opportunity to to um, to live that lifestyle for any amount of time, you can you can still do it once you're a little bit established. Yeah, man. Um, I'm it's, just it's glad she plays different. through an amp. Oh, for sure. You know. Yeah. She plays through a gain monster, but uh, you know the angle. They got a unique thing. You can dial those things back, and they sound like different amps. Yeah. You know, right? They work well for a lot of things, not just uh, oh, they you know the one trick pony. Yeah. That does the uh, the no mid range thing very well. Yeah, you know the, <laughs> they, um, the German engineering. You know. <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty musical amp. It's a pretty musical amp. You know, you know, uh, I, you're you're one of your favorite guitar players as a signature model over there. Did you know that? Um, Actually, two of our favorite be? guitar players, uh, Steve Morse and Richie Blackmore. Oh. Right, 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 right. They yeah. did do one with, with Blackmore yes, and Morse. Did. And Morse um, has his own, too. Yeah, it's funny because they're, uh, they're both Deep Purple associated. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> and, <laughs> and the latter funny. guy's been playing with them longer than the guy that started <laughs> <laughs> and it's probably true there's just that's tons of irony true. there you know <laughs> that's right that's right so well, until next time my friend that's right because we might find something even more ironic oh the next guy is incredible <laughs> my name oh, is yeah. mick marcelino <laughs> and i'm just jeff bober that's right and we're always saying onward Be sure and follow the show on Twitter, at Amps and Axis. Also, make sure you like the show on Facebook. For news, comments, and everything else, visit the webpage, ampsandaxiscast.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.